good afternoon. Um, good morning uh, to those in the US as well. Um, thank you for joining us uh, for today's uh, Sheko Base webinar. Um, my name is uh, Clara Zolser Skachenova, um, and I'm a market development manager at Sheko. And next to me is my colleague Andy. Yes, my name is uh, Andy Gizelis, and I'm the market intelligence analyst for Sheko. So in today's uh, webinar, uh, we would like to uh, talk to you about the upcoming uh, webinar, uh, sorry, about the upcoming um, guide uh, to CO2 transcritical refrigeration, uh, which uh, we are working on currently. Um, so before we uh, go into the topic, uh, I'd like to start uh, with some practical details. Um, so um, you have, you can see different options um, in your application um, to uh, check your audio settings. Um, you click on the audio. Um, if you have any difficulties hearing us, uh, please send us a message and uh, my colleagues um, who are helping us on the technical side uh, will give you some more instructions. Um, then I would like to uh, mention that uh, this is an interactive webinar, um, so uh, we'd like to uh, engage all of you in the discussion. Um, you can write your questions um, when you click on the Q&A. Uh, you can react to anything during the presentation or you can just highlight uh, the burning questions that you have in regard to the CO2 refrigeration. Um, also, we will have a few uh, polling questions uh, during the webinar, so we'd like to collect your feedback uh, during the, the webinar like that as well. Um, by default, all the participants are muted, uh, but we can um, unmute the microphone if you feel like you want to ask a question orally, so that's possible as well. In that case, please click on the raise hand uh, button. So uh, with this, I would like to start our first uh, polling question so we can test it and see if, uh, if you're able to see this. So first question, we'd like to know uh, where you're based, uh, just to see um, where people are, are coming from that are listening to the webinar um, and also um, what type of organization you're representing. So send us your feedback and uh, we'll have a look at the results in a bit. I see uh, some questions, some answers already coming in, so that's great. Um, while you're all answering, um, let me just uh, go th quickly through the agenda of today's webinar. Um, so I will give you um, a little bit of introduction about uh, the World Guide to CO2 Refrigeration. Um, what is the objective also um, of this webinar um, in that respect? Um, and then we will talk a little bit about um, the drivers for introduction of uh, CO2 refrigeration, uh, especially the policy and end user initiatives. Um, and we'll have a look at some key market and technology trends uh, for supermarkets, industrial applications, and small stores. Uh, we will take questions during the presentation, so feel free to type them in as, as we go through the webinar. Um, but we can also go back to some remaining questions at the end. Okay, just looking at the poll, I think we have received most of the, the answers. So I will share the results with you so that you see uh, who you're listening uh, to this webinar with. Um, so we have mostly representation from Europe, uh, North America, and then also uh, Asia, South America, and Africa. So that's great. Um, and we can see that there's uh, most interest from the side of uh, component manufacturers, uh, contractors, engineering uh, companies, uh, but we have some system manufacturers, end users, and government representatives. So this is a really nice representation, and um, I think some people will be joining a bit later as well. Um, so I will stop sharing this now. And we can start um, just uh, with the introduction of the World Guide to CO2 Transcritical Refrigeration. Um, so Sheka has been analyzing the market uh, for um, CO2 refrigeration for uh, several years. 
Um, and uh, we see that there is a growing number of installations, uh, but also a growing number of um, companies offering um, the technologies and end users that are taking up uh, this technology uh, more and more as a standard uh, solution. Uh, CO2 refrigeration is also entering into new applications like uh, industrial cold stores um, and even the smaller uh, convenience stores. Um, so with this in mind, uh, we wanted to have a, uh, a closer, more detailed look um, at the market and technology trends uh, for this type of technology um, globally. That means um, identifying trends in different parts of the world, including Europe, North America, um, Asia, Africa, uh, South America. Um, and uh, with this in mind, um, we also wanted to engage as much as possible with the companies um, active in this field. And this is why we also organized this webinar uh, to get feedback from you um, and see what are the burning questions um, that you would like uh, this world guide to answer. Um, so we have some ideas, but of course, uh, we would like to hear from you because we want these guides to be helpful also um, to the industry. So the report will be free and distributed online and on demand also in print. Um, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the supporters um, that uh, have decided to support this project. Um, and uh, I will start with um, the introduction to the policy. So with this, uh, what we wanted to uh, show is that uh, the introduction, uh, the uptake of uh, CO2 technology has been mostly driven uh, through policy and also end user initiatives. Uh, when it comes to policy, um, this, um, this comes in different forms. Uh, it could be uh, requirements on HFCs, HFC taxes, initiatives and subsidies. In essence, there are different policies uh, in different parts of the world. Uh, but what is common globally is that um, there is an increasing pressure to reduce the use of HFCs. And this pressure will not go away. It will only intensify in different forms. Um, and this is one of the reasons there um, has been uh, an agreement among the economies globally um, to reduce and phase down the use of uh, HFCs under the Kigali Amendment uh, to the Montreal Protocol, um, which will reduce drastically the use of HFCs uh, by 85% uh, by late 2040s. Um, developed countries will already start a reduction by 10% uh, as of next year. Uh, developing countries will follow uh, starting uh, 2024. So when it comes to regulatory requirements uh, on HFCs, um, they, these also take different forms. Um, as an example, um, the European FGAS regulation phases down uh, HFCs by 79% by 2030. And already up until now, um, it has um, resulted in a rapid growth of HFC prices. Um, we expect to see around 20, 20 time increase um, in 2018. In addition to the phase down, um, there is also a ban on HFCs in new equipment, uh, particularly relevant to the commercial refrigeration as of 2022. Um, and besides the European level legislation, um, there are national legislations that um, introduce prohibitions. For example, in Denmark, uh, there is a general ban on HFCs, um, which is strongly driving the introduction of uh, natural refrigerants, not only in commercial industrial refrigeration, but in other sectors as well. Um, there are bans introduced in Switzerland, Austria, California is also looking uh, to introduce um, HFC bans very soon. And besides these, there are other countries or regions as well. Um, some countries have uh, decided to introduce HFC taxes uh, to increase the price of HFCs um, and uh, this way to motivate um, companies and end users to invest in alternative technologies. Uh, the level of tax, the application of tax differ from country to country. Um, 
the details, if you're interested, uh, we can uh, also provide at a later stage. Um, the levels uh, vary between uh, 15 euros per ton of CO2 equivalent up to 50 euros per ton of CO2 equivalent, which is the case in Norway. Um, some other countries are also considering introducing it, this tax, so we might see some more joining uh, this year or next year as well. Other way to, um, uh, to motivate end users uh, to switch to um, CO2 technologies or other technologies using uh, low GWP refrigerants um, is to provide them incentives, subsidies. And this is the path that has been chosen by um, a number of countries. Uh, for example, in Japan, uh, this has, uh, the subsidy program has resulted in a major increase uh, for CO2 in convenience stores. Um, Germany has also been running an incentive scheme for several years. Um, and there is a requirement in this subsidy scheme for all new installations to use natural refrigerants, except small units. Uh, Canada is another country that supports CO2 and refrigeration uh, systems. Um, besides um, policies that, that encourage shift away from uh, HFCs, um, it's good to keep in mind that there's there are policies that could be a barrier, um, which was also the case uh, in Japan. Um, this barrier has been lifted. Um, this is the High Pressure, Pressure Gas Safety Act, which uh, previously classified CO2 under the strictest level. Um, and this meant that uh, the use of CO2 in larger applications uh, was uh, prohibitive. Uh, but in July 2017, uh, CO2 has been reclassified to Group 1, which is the least restricted, and this has opened up a huge amount of opportunities for CO2 in larger applications. So besides policies, end, user, end users are also driving the uptake of CO2 uh, and other uh, HFC-free um, uh, applications uh, in refrigeration and other sectors. The Consumer Goods Forum is a good example, uh, which groups around 400 retailers, manufacturers, and other stakeholders. Um, and under its uh, refrigeration resolution, it commits its members uh, to use only natural refrigerants um, or other ultra-low uh, refrigerants uh, wherever viable and immediately. Uh, Green Shield is another initiative, a uh, public private partnership with the US Environmental Protection Agency that works with food retailers to reduce refrigerant emissions. Um, besides this, um, individual retailers have their own commitments to reduce uh, the use of uh, high, GW, high GWP refrigerants. And um, also retailer rankings like the one um, that the Environmental Investigation Agency has been doing on a regular basis is uh, driving um, retailers to show their leadership uh, in the uptake of HFC free um, applications. So with this, um, I would like to give the words to my colleague Andy, who will uh, uh, tell you a little bit more about the market and technology trends um, for supermarket refrigeration. Andy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Clara. So uh, we will start uh, with a poll for this uh, section uh, connected to the commercial refrigeration uh, panel. And um, I will launch this now. The question is, what do you believe is the major barrier holding back a widespread uptake of CO2 in the supermarket sector? Uh, please uh, have, a th uh, have a think about this during the, this part of the presentation and uh, you can uh, vote for a few minutes. Uh, now, when we are looking globally for CO2 transcritical refrigeration in uh, the commercial sector, so referring a lot to supermarkets and food retail stores, uh, we can see that uh, Europe is a technology leader uh, in this sector and this uh, comes as a consequence uh, as Clara was mentioning due to legislation and also due to end user initiatives in this. Uh, in addition Europe has a, a large number of manufacturing companies who offer solutions and innovative systems for CO2 transcritical technology. Uh, in this data that you can see here Europe uh, from February 2018 uh, Europe counts 14,000 uh, CO2 transcritical stores 
Uh, however, during the update that is ongoing now and we're collecting data, we have already seen the major, the leading companies uh, already having reached this number. So our expectation is that this, numbers, this number has increased uh, quite substantially. Uh, following uh, Japan is also a big leader in this sector, uh, mainly due to the large number of small stores uh, and convenience stores using CO2 technology. Other than that, however, we see that the US is uh, slowly following in this uh, pace and increasing the number of stores. And uh, this comes a lot also with the initiatives from uh, retailers, uh, global retailers. Uh, we can also see that in other countries, such as China, the number has already increased to two stores right now. And there is a signal in the Chinese market that um, when these type of systems have been tested and the reliability and safety is uh, proved, then we will see an even larger increase uh, for this uh, market as well. Uh, now, uh, in terms to put these numbers a bit in a global perspective, uh, we can see that still in terms of percentage from overall stores around the world, uh, CO2 transcriptor stores hold uh, quite a small uh, percentage of this, particularly in uh, Europe, it's slightly, uh, it's slightly over 10%, almost 12% of uh, the total stores. And here we are counting supermarkets and specifically stores that are larger than 400 square meters. Uh, but globally, uh, it's uh, less than 10% of the amount of total stores uh, around the world, meaning that there is still a huge market out, the, out there in terms of supermarkets, in terms of convenience stores for this technology to increase the reach and the uptake. Uh, now, when we are talking about CO2 transcritical technology, uh, we hear often a lot, uh, yes, but what's the efficiency for warm climates? Uh, and people are mentioning the CO2 equator as well. Uh, there is data and information saying that with uh, developments in the technology, particularly from power compression, from ejectors, adiabatic cooling and some coolers, this technology has, is proving to be very efficient uh, and uh, really co cost saving and energy efficient also for warmer climates. Uh, particularly systems with ejectors are uh, increasing in numbers all over the world. Uh, and we can already count a few hundreds of systems uh, in this market. And when combined specifically parallel compression with ejector, then uh, we have seen many case studies opting for an integrated system where uh, the, the system itself can provide the refrigeration needs and as well the air conditioning needs of the, of the store proving to be even more efficient and environmentally friendly at the same time. Uh, based on uh, a survey that we have done already uh, through our uh, Shekobase platform, um, for the next 10 years, the dominating tech that is expected to be for the food retail sector, 50% of respondents uh, chose that it would be some transcritical CO2. So the market is uh, certain that CO2 will reach even higher numbers uh, in this market and will dominate and will become a standard for commercial refrigeration and food retail stores. Uh, some examples around the world uh, that we noticed, and particularly we have here a few examples also from warm, cli warm climates. Uh, there is a supermarket in India, India's first actually supermarket with CO2 transcritical ejector system, and it's uh, operating in temperatures, in temperatures up to 45 uh, degrees Celsius. And this is a system that provides also the air conditioning and heating uh, and heat recovery for the store. So it's a, an integrated system. And up until now, the results are that uh, the system is working properly and the end user who has installed it is uh, for now quite um, happy with the performance of this system. Uh, additionally, we, uh, there, are, there is a supermarket, the first supermarket in uh, Jordan 
again, uh, CO2 transcritical supermarket with parallel compression and multi ejector, uh, which has the possibility to work with uh, up to 32 degrees Celsius. Uh, also, we see in Poland another supermarket for actually uh, a larger stall, 12,000 uh, square meters, uh, with a multi ejector system. So, as you can understand, there are different types of uh, solutions that can be used all around the world and all of these systems are proving to be efficient uh, and uh, good for the commercial uh, refrigeration sector. And now I will close the poll that we already opened earlier. So, let's see. And uh, I will share the results with you. So, uh, what we believe is the major barrier here, uh, I can see that uh, the higher initial costs uh, is voted as one of the largest barriers. Indeed, that's actually an answer that uh, we have seen already quite a few times in questions and conversations that we have with people in this market. And um, the main thing to consider here is that yes, the higher initial cost is a barrier, but however, taking into account uh, energy savings, especially for integrated systems, then uh, we should always take into account the life cycle cost uh, for these type of systems and payback ratios prove to be uh, quite uh, good for these type of installations. I think what we have also seen in uh, some markets where um, CO2 technology has become more of a standard, like in Europe, um, is that the cost uh, becomes equal to um, the standard HFC technology. Uh, we have seen this in a, in a number of markets in Europe uh, where um, retailers adopt this technology as a, as a standard solution. Um, so indeed there is um, um, the reduction in cost that comes with economies of scale. Mm -hmm. um, and we should not forget that. Um, and uh, this is something that applies to any new technology. Um, but um, it's, as, you, as you pointed out, it's indeed uh, important to think about the lifetime savings as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we will stop sharing for now. So I think we have uh, also some questions uh, related to this um, section. Um, let me just do uh, a quick review. Um, So, um, um, there's a question, um, do ejectors cause an energy penalty and higher operation, operating cost when installed uh, for warmer climates? Um, well, we can also um, take this question uh, later on uh, when we look into the um, more the more the detailed uh, market research when we discuss with the experts um, and these kind of um, clues um, questions uh, that you, that you have um, are important for us um, in general ejectors are designed to actually help the energy efficiency um, in warmer climates um, so with this in mind that should not cause an energy penalty um, and uh, also to our knowledge up until now from some case studies, uh, what's important to notice is uh, for how many days per year, for how long the system, the CO2 transcritical system will work in these uh, transcritical phases, which uh, has an impact as well on the operating costs and the consumption of the system. And uh, the, the ejectors are there basically to help for this uh, work. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, I see there are actually uh, many questions, um, so maybe we will come back to them uh, towards the end because we have to go on with the, the rest of the presentation, uh, just to be sure uh, we manage on time. So. Um, I would ask Andy to continue yes. with industrial refrigeration. So jumping into the industrial refrigeration sector again, as before, uh, I'm going to share a poll with you uh, to get your opinion. Uh, for this market. The question is, what makes CO2 attractive for industrial uh, applications? And uh, I would like to hear your opinion actually on this. I'm very curious. Um, what we have seen for an industrial refrigeration market is that 
Traditionally, yes, it's been dominated by ammonia and uh, HFC, HCFC equipment. However, uh, natural refrigerant cutting edge technologies are becoming a strong trend and are starting to compete in this sector. We have uh, options with low charge ammonia, we have options with CO2 transcritical, a combination of the two, so an ammonia system and a, a CO2 cascade system for this. And uh, what we are noticing is that um, the key drivers for this is increased safety, higher efficiency, easier servicing, return on investments for the end user, and uh, as well prices slowly being pushed down as technology is becoming uh, more available. Specifically for CO2 in industrial refrigeration, um, it, it, we, can, we have seen in the latest time that uh, we, uh, it has been gaining quite some grounds in this. And this is because there is more availability of components for larger applications, uh, bigger capacity compressors, and also technology is now especially suitable. And this technology, uh, from some case studies that we've seen and some conversations, uh, is that it's especially suitable for below 300 kilowatt, where um, HFCs were traditionally used. And however, CO2's, uh, CO2 transcritical is a very efficient um, solution for this. And the kind of applications that usually it's applied, it's for refrigerated warehousing, uh, fruit processing, meat processing, wineries and uh, fish processing, and many more other types of applications. Um, what we've seen as a trend in this is that uh, especially end users who have an experience with CO2 transcritical uh, from maybe supermarkets, from the retail sector, they are also starting to use even more CO2 for their uh, cold uh, stores, for their refrigerated warehousing or the distribution centers. So especially from this type of end users who have an experience with it, they are moving more fast, but also even end users that uh, don't have experience, they are starting to see the benefits that they can have from using CO2 transcritical technology in this sector. Uh, again, from a poll, from some polls and some uh, questions, uh, surveys that we have done uh, in the past, um, for the dominating technology 10 years from now in the refrigerated warehousing sector, Indeed, low charge ammonia was uh, chosen to be as a more dominating technology for a bigger spectrum of these uh, kind of applications. But uh, transcritical CO2, as well as in combination with ammonia, also is expected to, ha to capture a part uh, of this market and to be an important competing technology, uh, especially for the lower end uh, applications that we were um, explaining earlier. Through questions that we have done during uh, atmosphere conferences around the world, as you can see in Australia and Asia, CO2 transcritical is expected to play an important role in industrial refrigeration over the next five years. Uh, in terms of the current status, uh, right now uh, we, it is estimated that more than 200 nose installations are operating today more than 25 companies are known to be providing CO2 transcritical systems for industrial applications. So uh, systems that have a capacity larger and uh, are possible for this type of processing and industrial uh, refrigeration applications. And all major component uh, compressor manufacturers uh, are offering uh, large capacity compressors and some of them are even aiming to push the limits even further on how much they can increase uh, the capacity of this type of compressors. Uh, some examples here uh, are around the world, different types of uh, installations uh, where CO2 is used for processing in Europe, in Italy, in Japan, here for um, a cold storage for fruit and uh, fresh fruit production facility where they have uh, they are using two CO2 racks and uh, they are claiming to have 10% energy savings and 2.5 years of uh, payback period. Um, or uh, uh, fish industry, the fish industry in Spain who is using two independent CO2 ejector systems and with a total uh, capacity, cooling capacity of uh, 950 kilowatt. 
Uh, so we can see that uh, CO2 is slowly moving also to larger capacities for this uh, sector. And again, other, uh, another case study in South Africa uh, for a meat processing facility where uh, information have been shared already that they have seen a 13% improved efficiency and a high 40% carbon emission reduction during uh, the plant's uh, lifetime. Now I will start to say, stop sharing the polling as well. So I will end the poll and let's see the results of this. <laughs> so uh, what makes CO2 more attractive? It is the only A1 safe and environmental friendly refrigerant. Indeed, uh, that's, uh, that's something very true actually and something that we've been hearing from presentations from uh, many key uh, researchers and uh, industry people. Um, there is a trend on moving to CO2 because they, it is believed that it, it offers proper uh, regulatory safety mm -hmm. in the future, policy safety, and uh, as well as a very friendly and safe uh, refrigerant compared uh, to other in the market. Interesting. Um, maybe we can have a quick look um, at some questions mm -hmm. uh, related to the industrial uh, refrigeration applications. Um, so um, we have a comment uh, also um, from uh, Terry Chap. Uh, the big driver in the US, at least for cold storage, um, is the regulatory environment which is complex and expensive for ammonia systems uh, regardless of charge level. Um, so indeed ammonia is um, the, the usual refrigerant um, or very common refrigerant in uh, uh, industrial applications around the world. Um, and um, in some cases, in some countries like in the US, uh, regulations make it very difficult uh, for ammonia to be used. Um, so in this case, in order to avoid um, the, the regulatory compliance, which in some cases, especially for um, small companies, uh, can, can be prohibitive, uh, it's easier to go for a solution that does not require um, such um, checking and um, notifying um, to, to the authorities. Um, uh, there is also a question uh, if uh, the results of the polls will be shared um, after the presentation. So yes, uh, rest assured that we will share the presentation and uh, the, the answers to the polls. Um, so um, 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 any idea on the estimated payback period uh, for installation in India? Um, Okay, so this is a question uh, to the previous section on supermarket refrigeration. Um, so I think this installation is very fresh. Um, and I think uh, that um, uh, the no. information has not for yet been shared. Case, for, the, for this case study, actually, this particular piece of information was not shared. <laughs> uh, even for the performance, it was uh, only qualitative information saying that the installers, uh, the end users were happy with the performance of the systems. But uh, would, it would indeed be interesting for us to check it and get in contact with them for the, for the publication of the guide to see mm -hmm. what the performance and the payback for this uh, case study is. So actually really good comment. Yes. So Thank you for in engaging in the discussion. I see many more questions, but uh, let's go to the next uh, section and then we'll take some more questions uh, later. So um, now we will uh, talk about small store formats uh, where CO2 is um, also becoming mm -hmm. very popular in different parts of the world. Yes, so uh, by now you know the drill. I will share with you, with you a poll for this uh, part as well. The question is, what is the main barriers for, barrier for CO2 technology for small stores that it needs to overcome? Uh, now, for CO2 options in the small stores, we have seen that even uh, more options are being uh, developed in the, the last uh, few years. 
Some are mini boosters, CO2 mini boosters, where basically the principle of the booster technology used for uh, bigger racks and bigger supermarkets, it's being used in smaller capacities and for the needs of, of smaller uh, stores, convenience stores. And we can see various companies uh, being active uh, with this type of systems. Condensing units are becoming more and more popular and they, there is an increasing availability of these type of systems around the world, especially now we see even more availability in Europe for these type of systems, apart from Japan, of course, where uh, we know that these systems are a major uh, technology and uh, a leading type of system for convenience stores, as well as uh, plugins, plugin units using CO2 here we can see some a bit less availability in the market but uh, nevertheless uh, there are uh, some companies uh, uh, having solutions with uh, co2 plugins uh, and then users uh, choosing to use this kind of technology uh, and for the current status of this market we have estimated right now under the ongoing research that uh, more than 6,000 stores globally are using uh, condensing units or mini boosters um, and more than 20 companies are known to be providing this type of CO2 condensing units and mini boosters in the market today. Uh, in terms of plug-in units, uh, we are aware of uh, for sure more than 4,000 plug-in units with CO2 installed today, uh, but of course we expect it uh, to be even more uh, in the future for some end users who choose this uh, type of technology. Um, sorry, just just a side note, if I may. Um, mm -hmm. uh, regarding this 4,000 plug-in units, um, that does not include uh, bottle coolers. Yes. Uh, this is only for showcases. Um, As mentioned, just a clarification. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, very correct. We are talking only about showcases in small food retail stores or so convenience stores. Uh, not bottle coolers as well. Uh, in terms of trends, here you can see in the pictures different types of systems uh, that are possible and available out in the market in terms of uh, condensing units and mini boosters. As we mentioned, Japan is a big leader in condensing units and we've seen Japanese uh, manufacturers uh, having many different solutions in the market. Uh, Europe is increasing more and more the availability of uh, condensing unit and mini boosters uh, also for manufacturers within Europe start a, a way who they have their own um, mm -hmm. solutions ranging from as low as 1 1.5 kilowatt cooling capacity to reaching 30 kilowatt cooling capacity for this type of systems and um, in Australia leading manufacturers are now ready to supply the market and we've, we are seeing an evolution uh, in that market as well. Uh, in terms of uh, some key studies, uh, there are many places where um, CO2 is being uh, used right now. Uh, an interesting key study is in Poland, where uh, the supermarket chain Pietronka under uh, Jeronimo Martins, uh, it's, uh, it's engaging into a project of equipping almost 3,000 convenience stores for the next few years with CO2 transcritical mini boosters with capacities from th 3 to 32 kilowatt for the needs of uh, their stores and they are expecting to see 20% energy, saving, uh, energy savings compared to the traditional HFC units. We've seen this type of systems being used in Indonesia, in Malaysia and reaching again like for systems of 15 uh, kilowatt cooling capacity to be reaching energy efficiencies uh, of 13% or even more. Uh, as well as the uh, case in France for a fair trade organic grocer, BioCoop21, uh, which is using CO2 plug-in units. And uh, you can see that these plug-in units are, cool, uh, are having a cooling capacity of 3.6 kilowatts with a CO2 load, load of less than one kilogram. So as you can see, these plug-in units with CO2 are particularly <laughs> interesting for the needs of um, small stores who want uh, their plugins to have a bit of a higher capacity and do not want to have restrictions in the charge uh, limit for the refrigerant within the plug-in system. At this point, we will also have a look at the poll that we shared in the beginning. 
So sharing the results. What is the main barrier for CO2 technology for small stores? Uh, as I created the same also with the, the question from the supermarkets, the higher initial costs. Indeed, uh, this is something that uh, it has been as a feedback also from manufacturing companies who do manufacture this type of uh, technologies that the, high, the initial cost is higher for these new and innovative systems. Uh, but again, it depends a lot on the life cycle uh, cost of the system and uh, the, the benefits that it can bring both from the cost side, from the efficiency side, as well as the regulatory uh, framework. So, right now we can continue with the questions. Yeah, so I will just switch to. Um, I will just look at the um, questions, whether we have some new ones uh, concerning um, the topic of uh, small store formats. I'm not sure if I see any. Um, okay, I see that um, people were also posting mm -hmm. uh, in the chat. Um, yes. So that's uh, where we have not been looking. Um, so um, I'm just looking quickly through this. Um, so um, a question uh, from Danny Ryan. Uh, the initial challenge for end users uh, was the initial capital increase in installing CO2 versus HFCs. Uh, what has been your experience? Um, so indeed the feedback uh, we've been hearing um, at many of the conferences that organize uh, Atmosphere Europe, uh, Atmosphere America and all the other regions. Um, we often hear from the end users um, that overcoming uh, the cost uh, barrier is, is very difficult sometimes, especially for uh, smaller retailers. Um, and um, some of them, um, they have introduced a planning uh, whereby uh, they adapt uh, the new technology, not only based on the initial capital cost, uh, but they take into, into consideration uh, the whole life cycle of the technology. Um, so taking into consideration the fact that you don't have to um, regularly refill uh, the system with HFCs, uh, the cost of which is going up, um, especially for the moment in Europe. Um, but the example of Europe uh, should be seen um, as, as an example that will apply globally uh, once the Kigali Amendment of the Montreal Protocol kicks in in other regions as well. Um, so uh, that's something um, that needs to be considered as well. Um, but as I said, um, it, it really depends from country to country, region to region, type of technology, um, the different conditions that need to be uh, applied. Um, so it, it, it probably shouldn't be just uh, considered um, taking into consideration one condition, uh, which is the initial cost. Um, don't know if you have anything to add. Um, uh, no, I totally agree that uh, there are many parameters that we should always be looking into this type of case studies and installations. Or when we are doing installation, doesn't mean that for one what ha happens for one country or one region is the same for different regions. Uh, we have noticed there are quite a few case studies actually which uh, we are going to use also for this uh, CO2 transcritical guide and uh, there have been comparisons for systems with HFCs and systems with CO2 uh, in terms of the initial costs, in terms of their operating costs. So, and from these uh, case studies, real actual cases with supermarkets, uh, they have uh, found the results show that the CO2 systems uh, have um, a low payback uh, period and also in the entire life, cy life cycle system, uh, it, the costs are actually less for the CO2 transcriptical system. So there are savings for these type of systems. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, it matters a lot in which place we are. It's, it's a factor of many parameters. There might be a store that has 
uh, a full integrated solution taking into account the AC or the heating needs of the store there, there you can really see mm -hmm. more savings uh, of, uh, for these systems. Yes, the initial cost might be a little higher, uh, but uh, if you take into account all the parameters, uh, it's systems that pay off quite fast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, another question um, and comment. Uh, there has been historically a challenge for end users um, regarding CO2 solutions for small shops. Um, have you seen growth in CO2 solutions for small scale refrigeration systems? What is the efficiency of CO2 versus hydrocarbon solutions? Um, so in terms of the growth, um, yes, Andy um, has, I think, answered this. Um, there is definitely growth. Um, in different parts of the world, um, as CO2 technology is becoming more widespread, um, the manufacturers are, are also introducing increasingly solutions for smaller and larger applications. And this is a trend we see in different regions. Um, and we can anticipate, uh, especially for small stores, that we will see a huge increase in the coming years because the market for small stores is even bigger than for, for supermarkets. Um, in terms of efficiency of CO2 versus hydrocarbon solutions, uh, this is an interesting topic um, and uh, there are different opinions uh, in the industry. Um, so perhaps it would be interesting also for us uh, to look into this um, in more detail uh, for the CO2 report, uh, because indeed hydrocarbons are a serious competitor to CO2 in the small store applications. Um, and um, it's, yeah, I mean, we're all for a healthy competition uh, yeah. between natural refrigerants. Um, and uh, we believe that both uh, solutions uh, will find their uh, place in the market, uh, will have their market share. Um, what we have received as a feedback for now is that hydrocarbons uh, make more sense in, uh, in smaller stores, uh, whereas CO2 is more competitive um, in a little bit larger, but still convenience stores. Um, but I think this, this type of question, um, the answer will evolve over the coming years uh, because the technology is still young. Um, and uh, I think we will, see, uh, we will see a lot of interesting developments in this area. Um, okay, I see Danny Ryan has been very active. Um, so another question from him, uh, at what size system uh, would you say ammonia becomes more efficient? Um, so uh, this, actually I will not answer this question. What I will answer uh, connected to this is um, what we have seen from some case studies and from some experts that have shared, been sharing opinions with us is that for when we are talking about the competition between CO2 and ammonia, uh, CO2 is uh, proving to be quite efficient for the uh, for more extreme low uh, temperatures uh, mm -hmm. applications. So when we are talking about very low temperature applications, CO2 has a high efficiency. It depends also where in which regions uh, these installations are, these systems are. Uh, but that's uh, the feedback from the market. Whereas when we are moving to temperatures higher, but still uh, below zero, then uh, low charge ammonia is uh, is proving to be a better solution uh, mm -hmm. through case studies at least. Now the size of the system, that's something that I cannot answer right now, but it's something that I could look for the through case studies and talking with some experts for the guide itself. Yes. Um... Okay, uh, another comment um, in this segment uh, for very large quantities, the lack of trained personnel is the bottleneck. Um, I think um, this is in general the issue uh, in the market, whether it's Europe, North America, um, the lack of trained personnel uh, is a bottleneck in um, a faster uptake of the technology. Uh, but what we've seen is that it comes um, side by side. So with increased uptake of technology, there is also more interest from the installers to um, be able to maintain the systems. Um, so indeed, it will take some time. Um, it doesn't happen by itself. 
um, and, there, and there needs to be a lot of focus on training, um, indeed. Um, a comment from Javier Pardo, um, a clarification in Colombia, we currently have four stores in operation, one more ready to start up. Uh, great, uh, this is um, very uh, good information for us. Um, and uh, I would, with this, I would also like to, um, oops. I would also like to let everybody know about the next steps, um, because indeed, um, we are um, looking for this kind of information. Uh, we are looking for data. Um, and um, as for the next steps uh, for this research, uh, we will be uh, soon launching an online survey uh, to which you're all very welcome to contribute. Uh, we'll be also conducting interviews with uh, key manufacturers and users. Um, and also government officials, um, academia. Um, so if you have suggestions, if you would like to provide us some information, um, this would be very much appreciated. Um, in terms of um, data, numbers of stores, capacities, um, we are also looking to, to hear from you what exactly you are interested to know. Uh, what will help you um, as a business, as an end user, uh, to, uh, to know uh, about this market for CO2. Um, so we can look at the numbers of stores, we can look at the numbers of ejectors, um, or is it something else that you're looking for? So let us know. Uh, we will be uh, analyzing these trends. Um, and uh, I just uh, see that we have a few more questions, but um, Looking at the time, I also wanted to um, say that at the beginning I mentioned uh, that um, there is a possibility for participants um, to give a comment orally. Uh, by default, you're muted, but um, if you raise a hand, uh, the option that you can uh, see in your uh, webinar application, um, if you raise a hand, uh, we can unmute you and um, you can uh, orally contribute to the discussion. Um, so I see that Saad Dilthat uh, has raised hand. Um, so I will... Uh, oops. I will allow him to talk. I hope it's going to work. Yes, so it should be possible for us to hear. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Hello? No. Okay, if there's anybody else, um, because I, I think we might have issues with um, hearing SAT. Um, if there's anybody else uh, that would like to um, contribute orally, um, please don't hesitate to raise hand um, and we can I'm, unmute your microphone. Um, I know that there are um, a lot of uh, experts listening to this uh, discussion, so I'm sure you all have a lot to contribute. Oh, I think he's writing something. Ah. Uh, okay, so what is the question? Uh, is there, uh, okay, so the question from Sad Dilsat um, was, is there any solar thermal air conditioning system using CO2? Um, so, uh, as I understand this, uh, probably he, uh, Sad is meaning this in combination with, uh, with a CO2 heat pump. Uh, for sure, like, the, this uh, this sector, so the air conditioning sector with CO2 itself or in combination with the heat pump is not really the focus of this guide itself. However, we have uh, seen such combinations. I don't recall to mention a specific case study right now or a specific, spe specific example, but uh, it's something that we can uh, look into. I would expect uh, if there would be um, a solution like this, uh, 
probably we could find it somewhere in the Asia Pacific uh, region, a case study where CO2 heat pumps uh, are uh, quite a, a popular uh, mm -hmm. option. Yeah. Um, indeed, um, there's um, definitely scope for, uh, for this and um, we could look into it. Um, just a side note that uh, the focus of this guide is uh, on a refrigeration for supermarkets, cold stores, industrial applications. Um, so as, as part of that, um, we will not be looking in particular at air conditioning unless it's part of an integrated system in a supermarket. Um, but indeed, um, we always like to hear about uh, new technologies uh, using natural refrigerants. Uh, we always keep an eye on that. Mm, okay. I see there are uh, a few more questions um, uh, or comments um, from Pakistan. It's a great opportunity. I'm working on a project design of a solar thermal cold storage system using uh, natural refrigerant CO2 uh, from where I can uh, get helping material. Uh, so we'll be happy, Emil, to, to get in touch with you um, after this webinar um, and uh, we can we can give you some if, more information. If you can drop us a quick email with your contact details, a bit more about uh, this uh, uh, this uh, work that you're doing, we can definitely get uh, in, in touch and uh, share some information on this. It sounds like a really interesting case. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are now um reaching the end of uh, of our webinar i just wanted to share with you um one last slide um i'm sorry but my presentation unexpectedly closed that sometimes happens uh when you have a, a webinar we cannot expect the technical <laughs> issues apologies for that i hope you can now see my screen um so uh, just a final note, um, I would also like to encourage um, those working with the technology, uh, with the CO2 transcritical technology to join the supporters. Um, just uh, to let you know, uh, we have a special pre venti discount on uh, visibility options. And um, if you're interested, uh, just drop me an email. Um, my uh, email is right here. Also, if you're interested to contribute with data uh, information, um, feel free to, to send us um, more info. We can do um, even interviews by phone if that's easier. So we're always uh, happy to hear about what's going on uh, in the world of CO2 refrigeration. Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, thank you all for listening in. Um, and uh, we have recorded the webinar. so. Yes. We will share um, the presentation, the recording of the webinar in the coming days, um, as well as uh, the answers to uh, the polling questions. Um, thank you very much and um, hope to talk to you uh, in the coming weeks and months about this exciting project. Thank you very much.